Well, hello there, amazing people. We're going to watch a video, and it's uh, why VPNs are a waste of your money usually. And I've, I've said this for a long, long time. And you, one thing, I'm not a security expert. I'm not even a computer expert, but I do talk to a lot of security experts and computer experts. And I kind of form my opinion by talking to knowledgeable people. And it's done by the Cyber Spatial or something like that. Uh, I watched some of his videos before, and he's actually a really, really cool cat. Uh, really, really good video. So I recommend, uh, again, there will be links to his, this video down below, so you can just watch this and you can subscribe to him because he knows what he's talking about. But but let, let's get into the video here. Have you ever wondered if VPNs really do much for your privacy and security? They don't. You see, I've been using VPNs for a long time, mostly to hide my IP address from the ISP so they wouldn't send my parents angry letters about my internet usage. Sometimes <laughs> I'd sign into sketchy Wi-Fi and wanted yeah. to double wrap. Circumventing geoblocks and censorship when traveling also came in handy. But something always felt fishy about I I, I love his editing skill. I, I wish I had the patient and, and uh, the know-how to do it. And, and I know it's just about setting up the right workflow. I hate the work, word workflow, but yeah, it, it's... um. I, I need to do more of this, like the quality of the editing here. It, it's it's really good. About VPN, since instead of trusting the ISP that you do know, you decide to trust some guys in Europe and an ISP that you don't know. I decided to check out what the VPN providers themselves are saying about this stuff. Malicious websites can infect your devices with malware. Unless you use no VPN apps, keep your activity and identity private while you browse, stream, email, or download. Protect all of your devices with just one click. I guess internet hacking is also that easy. Oh, EP spelled coffee in his computer again. Selling online security and privacy as being all about VPNs is like telling people health and well-being is all about face masks, which <laughs> that don't. I don't know if if I'm going to get. Uh, let, let me put it this way: what he just talked about that the something is 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 about is it's about only to using this product. It has been debunked how efficient they really are. The the, the, the things that you just saw someone put on is. Uh, been shown to not be efficient at all. You need to use the N95 masks or something like that. It sounded a little bit like snake oil to me, so I decided mm. to take a look at the history of snake oil. And what I learned was actually kind of interesting. Yeah. A long time ago, Chinese immigrants moved to San Francisco. Moving. To build the railroads of America and brought with them snake oil from the Chinese water snake as an ancient traditional medicine to treat arthritis and joint pains, since it contains 20% EPA, a type of omega-3 fatty acid known for its anti-inflammatory properties. Cowboy entrepreneur Clark Stanley started hawking it as a cure-all that turned out to be beef fat, chili peppers, camphor, and turpentine. Stanley got, Tur -tur <laughs> Wait, what the fuck? got slapped with a symbolic fine of $20 by the government leaving him a wealthy man and spawning an industry of other products and salesmen just like him. Mm. Yeah. I, I think back in the day, they also used arsenic as a form of remedy for something like that. There's also, I, I just watched a documentary about corpse medicine where they took corpse, you know, dead people, and, and they used different parts of them and made it into powder and oils and stuff like that. And depending on in what form you, you got it and how you took it, it will help you, you know, get rid of diseases, stay younger, longer, and stuff like that. Google it. it it's a really interesting subject. You see, the problem with VPNs is that just like snake oil, it's fantastic in its original form and function which is to bridge two remote sites together or allow an individual to securely connect to a different network. The whole point is to tunnel your internet from a network of lower trust to a network of higher trust. A corporate VPN, for instance. It's kind of like entering a wormhole to get from point A- Hey, Portal! If you want to ruin a friendship, play Portal 2 Co-op. A to point B, bypassing everything in between. But things start to get dicey if you're going from a high to low trust, low to low trust, or an I don't know level of trust. And right now, it feels like a lot of fear mongering in this industry. We got oh yeah, 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 yeah. The security industry have the same problem as almost any industry that's based upon you feeling safe or your security level. They do a lot of fear mongering. 
because it sells product. If they can, if they can entice fear into you, you're more likely to buy a VPN or a, a, a higher security lock on your door or a fucking nuclear bunker. We got everyday folks convinced VPNs are what they need to keep themselves private and secure. But in reality, they're just paying for slower speeds, time spent training machine learning algorithms, and being lumped in with all the spammers and hackers abusing these services. Yep. Sometimes you just have to remind people that most of their web browsing is already encrypted without a VPN and securing your DNS traffic in Firefox or Chrome is literally just a click. I pulled Alexa's top million websites and wrote a script checking for HTTPS support and found Wait, 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 wait. Let's see. Can you guess what programming language he's using here? Trivia. It's actually like, yeah, it's not that hard to see. You can actually kind of see. Uh, if I take my mouse, you can kind of see what it is up here. But I, I hope that you didn't cheat. Found that most of the first 90,000 did. At this range, we're looking at sites like QTelfreeDownloadTrader.com, which I'm sure we all visit every day. Worst of all is when companies want you to install their custom VPN client, forward your DNS over to be leak proof, and even install their certificate authority on your device, which is like charging people so you can man in the middle of them. <laughs> but at the same time, isn't there some value in masking your IP address when surfing the internet? We need to dig deeper. Deeper. When your computer talks to a server, I'm going to do a that, that joke. That's what she said. It sends packets tagged with a source and destination IP. These traverse the local network and a series of ISPs to reach the final destination. Anything logging traffic in between can see your source IP address, which can get geolocated to within a few zip codes away from your home. I, I actually did this. <laughs> I got uh, my, um, what, what is it called? Uh, GTA account got hacked because the launcher was fucking unsecure as balls. And, um, also, I didn't enable two-factor authentication because I'm stupid. So I, I woke up one morning and I had like hundreds of emails because you got an email every time there was a conversation on that platform about friend requests and stuff like that. And then I logged into my account and I could see the chat messages. And it was this dude chatting to his friend that, oh, I just got this account. Add me, add me, add me, add me. And he also hacked it from, I was like only starting out. So I was like in the end game and I had all of these fucking kind of things going on and stuff like that. So I, I tracked his IP address down and I was like, uh, first I, I wrote to the uh, support line and they, I think they banned him or locked him out of my account and I changed my account name, password, enabled two-factor authentication, all of that fucking shit. But I also, I think I mailed him and said, you do know I'm getting all your emails that you're telling your friends about my account. And you're living in this area here and here. And if you don't stop it, I will go to your local police and basically suing you for identity theft or something like that. And in that country, you could do that because research the law in that country. And he wanted to be my friend. <laughs> well, I, I, I didn't mean to. And uh, I just don't have money for the game. And uh, you seem like a nice guy. Can't be friends. I'm like, dude, no. Um, but yeah, uh, Rockstar, the Rockstar launcher, that's the name of it. It had, 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 have had and still have a massive hacking problem. Your IP is probably shared by hundreds of other people and rotates regularly, so it's only an approximate location, not where you sleep at night. Nope. With a VPN tunnel, the original packet gets encrypted and wrapped in another IP header with a VPN server as the destination. I love this fucking shit. I'm going to subscribe to this dude when I'm done here. Like, I love this. It's like... You guys who sub to him right now, this is really good video making. The server will unwrap the packet and forward it through its own ISP, using its own IP address as the source. Devices sitting before the VPN server can see your source IP, but not the destination. Devices sitting after can see the destination, but not the source. The zones of visibility in the network path are now partitioned. Or are they? Say hi to Elliot. Elliot wants to save the world by being a hacktivist. He uses a VPN to mask his IP address, but doesn't factor in all this other stuff. Instead of disappearing, Elliot leaves a blazing trail for the feds to follow. Elliot goes to jail. Yeah, and and I've said this a lot to people that are debating uh, VPNs with, is that it, it does have its merits, and uh, he, he would go into this, I hope, I think he will. But it's just a speed bump. The end. Here's the deal. 
Focusing on just the IP header is focusing on just the tip of the iceberg. When you look at a network packet, there's metadata present across all layers of the OSI model. Depending on the vantage point of an observer in your network path, there's different visibility levels into your packet. Every piece of software you install, whether an app or plugin, can potentially be malicious, surveilling your data and activity before it even leaves the device. On the local network, there's layer two addressing information that lets tech companies identify your location without an IP address through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth positioning. Looking at proximity and signal. Oh, 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 I was out walking the other day and one of those fucking cars just drove past me. I'm like, oh my God, I hope I'm not naked. Signal strength to nearby devices with known geolocations like your friend's phone, smartwatch, or wireless access point can help pinpoint your device too. The local ISP probably knows you're using a VPN based on the IP header alone, since just like Tor exit nodes, there's a fixed number of VPN addresses out there to track on a watch list. The VPN company and their ISP are privileged to see the real packet's metadata and can fingerprint your device type with the IP, TCP, and TLS headers. VPNs may claim to not log this stuff, but they do. But you can bet that the cloud providers and ISP servicing them are. There's probably also a money trail out there leading back to you, even with Bitcoin. Now the server you're going to, they can easily tell you're on a VPN since the MTU size or max transmissible unit on the packet is going to be smaller than usual yep. since we're tunneling one packet inside of another. Valdek SS even has code on his GitHub page that can fingerprint the type of VPN you might be using and runs a proof of concept on his website. That's why when, if you are using VPNs for Netflix, if you're using the uh, not so expensive VPNs that tend not to get updated, you know, the IP addresses don't get updated as fast often, or most commonly they don't get updates that fast. When you go on to, let's say Netflix, that has happened to me a lot of times or other websites, they will be like, oh, you're using a VPN and some website will even fucking tell you what VPN provider you're using. And that's because of the things that he's saying right here. Watch list and this kind of fingerprinting helps sites like banks flag any VPN connections and deny you service. But there's also juicier ways to track you. Mm. I looked at payment company Zelle, owned by another company that's owned by seven major banks, to see which tracking methods were listed on their privacy policy. Social media. Besides the usual suspects like Google Analytics, cookies, or social media plugins, there's also e-tags, HTML5 local storage, mm -hmm. single pixel web beacons, JavaScript, and device tokens provided from your smartphone. All these identifiers get rolled into fingerprinting graphs designed to tie multiple IPs, accounts, and devices back to a single user for tracking purposes. Advanced actors occupying multiple vantage points on a network path can correlate traffic patterns together, just like pieces of a puzzle. Yeah. If you're at Starbucks using their Wi-Fi, Google's registering your hardware address, location, timestamp, true IP, Google accounts, and services, then correlating that with your internet usage. And if you're the government, you can just buy or ask for that data. This video is sponsored by Bad VPNs. Forget five eyes, nine eyes, 14 eyes. They're registered in all of the countries, so Yay! no one feels left out. They protect your traffic with BES-256, a military-inspired encryption that safeguards all the keys so you don't have to. Selling your data to telemetry partners lets them offer the low price of $2 a month. Yeah, Pay yeah. now with Dogecoin and you'll Boom. receive a 3% discount. Sign up now at badvpns.com. I want but it. Seriously, let's look at the story of a Swiss company called the Crypto AG. I've heard about that. Oh, hey, hello. Crypto was founded in the 1950s by Boris Haglin, who invented portable encryption devices for the United States in World War II. He became close friends with William Friedman, NSA's chief cryptologist. No, not the Friedman from the Half-Life. Uh... ...and formed a plan to end the dark age of American cryptology. Later oh, on, yeah. the CIA and German intelligence secretly purchased the company in a joint venture called Rubicon, selling crypto devices to over 120 governments. This is a tinfoil hat moment, <laughs> oh my god. ...governments throughout the world. They architected the ownership through a series of shell companies using bearer shares so that no names appeared in registration documents. This was all made possible through professional firms like DTG, now known as KPMG. Oh my god. I I, <laughs> I used to service their cars. They had a local uh, department here in my city. And, and they were... <laughs> they had a... <laughs> they had a... Um, 
service agreement with the company I worked for. I used to service all their cars with the other mechanics. They, they had some really fucking hot ladies working for them, I just have to say. Or the law offices of Markshire and Goop, now Markshire and Partners, who were all paid to sign the deals and keep quiet. They'd also operate through cover companies like Intercom Associates or private partnerships with Siemens and Motorola to influence crypto's algorithms. The operation at one point accounted for nearly 40% of NSA's data take, generating millions in profits, split 50-50 cash in a parking garage to plow into other operations. Intel from crypto devices helped the US in everything from the Iranian hostage crisis, Falkland Islands war, and presidential negotiations. But crypto was just one target. These guys owned or influenced everyone else too, as long as they worked on encryption gear. Wow. This firm was clean, but got targeted with smear campaigns. Now the Windows versus Linux debate seems a little bit like a drop of water. Because they stayed independent. What's interesting about Rubicon is that a lot of other countries were all in on the secret. They went after almost anyone, including NATO partners, Wedding, semi wedding target, like the target, unknowing. What does that mean? Like Spain, Greece, Turkey, friendly countries like Japan, South Korea, even Mexico. And of course, Israel always gets the inside scoop. Leave it to the Germans to not spy on their friends. <laughs> you see, the nature of VPNs makes it the perfect asset for intelligence agencies. If I had to spy on people, I'd just set up a few dozen competing VPN companies register in various offshore jurisdictions with hidden ownership, then push it as a security and privacy tool for the mass market to adopt. That's fucking brilliant. Like, let's be honest, it's fucking brilliant. And trust me, this is probably the least intrusive things that the, that the governments and companies are doing to you, to, to you right now. Like, this is probably just like I said, like a drop of water also in the bucket. It's perfect, since instead of having to collect all over the world, people will pay for the honor of shipping their data to you. Or you can just hack any legitimate VPN servers directly and save on the marketing budget. Since VPN companies will often rent or white label their infrastructure to multiple other brands, hacking the servers has a pretty good payoff. VPN Pro tells us that over 100 products out there are owned by just 23 parent companies, with six of them in places like China. Oh. But wait, why trust VPN Pro? Aren't they just another review site? Like, why is it 9.4 versus 9.3 stars? Is there really a difference in that tenth of a star? How do you know they're not just promoting some products while smearing others as part of a complex spy operation? If you look at that one privacy guy's VPN chart, which unlike most review sites is actually kind of independent and doesn't use silly terms like military grade crypto, you'll see this boom in VPN companies post Snowden around the 2013 era. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of custom scores, only one out of 185 providers get over nine stars on my red to green color scale. So now you might be wondering, what are the use cases where a VPN makes sense? Should I even try to mask my IP address? How do I not get spied on doing this? Before you can answer these kind of questions, first you want to figure out what your threat model is. Is it cyber criminals, big tech companies, your government? Developing the right threat model can help. Uh, and again, th this is why I I, f I, I, I laugh at, again, we, I, we are Linux gen, we have to talk about Linux. I laugh when Linux people are talking about security because they don't do this. They don't look at what, what are we trying to protect our, ourselves against. They say, oh, telemetry and data collection. They, again, yeah, that's just one part of it. But like I said, hey, you need to understand what your threat is so you can actually prevent it. And most Linux YouTubers don't even understand. Like they, 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 they still think that VPNs is more secure than anything else in the world. Help tailor your level of paranoia accordingly so it's not over or underweight. For most people, practicing digital hygiene and cleaning up your online identity isn't that complicated. Use a unique password for every site. Use a unique email for every site. Use hardware security tokens for two-factor authentication. Use random answers for recovery questions. Yeah. Go through all of your settings on your accounts. San sanitize your social media. Use yeah. virtual machines and multiple phones for different kinds of activities. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah. click links or scan QR codes without analyzing them first. Yeah, exactly. I, I've gotten plenty of emails where YouTube has well, not YouTube, but people pretending to be YouTube telling me to check my something is wrong with your channel or 
uh, you just qualified for this fucking feature when I know for a fact I can't qualify for it. But if you get an email, always look at where it's coming from. Where's my emails coming from? Does it make sense? Like, have I signed up for a lottery? You know, is it if it's too good to be true, it's a lie. Set up a commercial address so you don't receive mail at home. Keep apps to a minimum and avoid pirated software. Yeah. Use a host-based firewall to... A lot of security risk, and I know a lot of you Linux guys are not going to like it because you do this fucking shit. Pirate software. I think the data started that 80 or 90% of it had some form of malware or a malicious code in it to, to some, in one way or another, basically abuse you. Alert on outbound connections that you manually need to verify for every app. If you're traveling and tempted by public Wi-Fi, just bring your own internet through a portable hotspot or by tethering off your phone. None of those options involve using a VPN, yet do far more for your security and privacy overall. Now, don't get me wrong, but there are cases where you probably should mask your IP address. Circumventing IP blocks to watch Netflix, mm -hmm. getting around national firewalls, mm -hmm. bypassing download limits, mm -hmm. performing offensive security assessments, mm -hmm. conducting OSINT and research. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just want to keep your home IP address out of breach dumps for people to collect and target you specifically. In these cases, I strongly recommend renting a cloud VPS and just do it yourself, whether it's WireGuard, ShadowSox, WebProxy, or even good old SSH tunnel. This way, you understand the technology a bit more and now use a wormhole that you created and can personally control some of the infrastructure of the exit node. But wait, remember that one out of 185? The team behind that provider does seem a bit more trustworthy than the others. I'm not gonna say who, but I will share some things to consider if you don't wanna set up a VPN yourself. Here's how you find a good VPN, and that's two things, humanity and reputation. Humanity means knowing the people who actually own and operate a service. You can reach out and they'll talk to you. And this goes for everything. It's just not VPNs. If you are, if you want to deal with a company and if you're talking a lot of money, reaching out to them is a really good idea because you get a notion of how that company is being run. And like I said, like he said there, it's the actual humans behind it. The more you get automatic responses, if you're talking to AIs and, and every time you ring up, it's a fucking different person in a different country and stuff like that, you should be really worried, okay? Really worried. But if you're calling or emailing and it's kind of like the same people or the same level of quality of contact that you're getting, it's a good sign. The more shell companies, anonymity and third parties involved, the less humane it becomes. Yeah. When things go wrong, it's easy to opt out of being accountable. Reputation takes years to build and a moment to lose. If a provider's brand new, it's hard to imagine they've put in enough work to build it up. Yep. You want people who are honest about their mistakes, communicate early and often, and take action to fix things. Linux, a lot of Linux people don't, like, when we had the pseudo preach in Linux, who came out with it? Third party security experts, and the lighting is all over the place today. It, it's not the distribution makers, or, or, or it was not pseudo coming out with it. Like with, with, let's say Windows or Mac, it's third party people figuring it out. They're contacting Windows, and then in, in, either in conjunction with Windows or Mac OS or Apple, they are doing a statement. Sometimes it don't happen, but that's my experience that most of the times that's what's going on. Where under open source, I've noticed a lot that it's rarely where Someone finds an error and then they talk to the developers and then the developers are making a statement. It's always the people finding it, making this a, just a statement and then the developers reacting to it. And that's a really bad way. And when I say most of the time, again, hashtag not all, but I see that going on a lot. Or they just update and you don't know why they're updating it. And you have to hunt down like a CVS in a forum post that's like on the bottom of the list or something like that. They, Open source and Linux needs to be way more transparent when it comes to stuff like that. And and I kind of have a problem with that, where you can fault Windows and Mac OS for, and Apple, Microsoft, all you want, but they tend to be a lot more transparent when it's coming to a problem like that. And that builds, like he said, that builds trust. Even if it means massive self-sacrifice, just when it's really inconvenient to do so. You want people who have skin in the game personally mm -hmm. using their own products, so there's incentive to protect and make it better, Aww. with something valuable at stake. If there's enough humanity and reputation to trust them with your mother's purse, then maybe, just maybe, 
you found a good VPN. I like this. I, I hope I hope this is a little bit different um, reaction video. This I, I, this week I'm going to upload two. This one and, and the one you saw previously. If you're watching my reaction videos, or depending on how the fuck is, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how I upload them. But yeah, I I just wanted to really talk about this because it it is really 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 interesting, and um, a lot of people don't really understand security. I don't understand security. I will highly recommend that you fucking subscribe to this dude here. Yeah. Let's let's get it back to Linux. I will not take security advice for, from any Linux YouTuber on YouTube. I have not yet found anyone that is a security expert. It's kind of like taking self-defense advice from someone that has watched a Bruce Lee movie. Or taking mechanic advice for someone that has only uh, mended a bicycle. I don't mind anything else. Uh, opinions, philosophies, yeah, listen to them. But if Chris Titus Tech is getting you security advice, don't listen to him. Is Est if Estek is doing it, don't listen to him. If DistroTube is doing it, don't listen to him. Is If uh, Nick from the Links Experiment, don't listen to him. Epos Central, don't listen to him. Me, don't listen to me. Easy TLC, don't listen to them. Don't listen to anyone that have no working experience, certifications, or have provable knowledge about security because it's really important because you can really fuck yourself up with bad security advice. But I will go to people like this dude here. This dude here or other channels where it, it's security experts. And there are plenty of channels out there where it is vetted security experts talking about security and you should listen to them way more than any of us fucking Linux YouTubers because we don't know much about security so if you want to want me to deep deep into more of these educational videos let me know because I find them really highly interesting but again follow this dude or someone like this this channel here if you want security uh, advice don't listen to any of us fucking Linux YouTubers because we just use us okay we have no idea about security. See you all later. Bye-bye.